Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Shannon. Uh, I am a partner with Grant Thornton and uh, a graduate of the, uh, okay, good morning, everyone. The MAC class from 1990. Uh, there is a dog barking in the background, I guess, with everything that goes on these days. We'll have, uh, there's all kinds of different noises that can get in the way, but I'll, we'll try <laughs> to manage him. He, he's a, he's a, he's a COVID puppy. He, we've had him for uh, j about two months now, so. Um, but uh, we've been doing this presentation for quite some time. Um, we started it uh, while I was still, I think, a senior manager, and we've been doing it pretty much every year uh, for uh, 25 years. We've done it uh, uh, for, uh, uh, it started out when we, when we first did it, we did it as an introduction to IDEA, um, and then there was an assignment that, you're, uh, that you, you do as part of the course, and um, nobody could do the assignment, so we changed it into basically a, a, a seminar type way. We worked through the assignment, and then we upgraded the assignment. It went from being a payroll uh, type assignment to uh, one that was more applicable to what we would uh, use IDEA for, which is in, in inventory and uh, and uh, accounts payable. So um, we've uh, one of our one of our former staff. She actually upgraded the assignment to. Um, resemble one that we use in our internal training, and that's the one that, that um, Kayla and APAC are going to uh, work through today. So Kayla and APAC are also MAC graduates from the class of 2018 or 17? Yep. <laughs> 2018. Yeah. So um, they were brave enough to do the presentation last year because uh, I had a senior manager who had uh, who had done it for a number of years with us, and uh, he he left Grant Thornton for an opportunity within his family business. So I I coerced them into doing it last year, and they enjoyed it. So they're back for this year. Um, they at least told me they enjoyed it anyway. So um, <laughs> so we're going to go through it today. I suspect an hour and a half is probably about the amount of time that we need. Um, the well, well, one of the challenges of doing it uh, live. Uh, online rather than in person is that we'll need to know if people are struggling and don't find something so you're going to have to make sure that you let us know that if, if something's not working for you as we work through this um, they'll uh, they will stop and we'll make sure everybody catches up or at least catches up to a reasonable place but as a firm we use idea all the time um, we use it uh, for uh, journal entry testing we use it for Inventory testing, it works great in a manufacturing environment. Um, it does some things different. A lot of people will, uh, will eventually ask why we don't use it for, uh, why, why we use IDEA instead of uh, Excel. Um, it, does, uh, it does things that Excel doesn't do, which is the last point that was on the previous slide. And, um, oh. I'm getting there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry, my fault. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, so um, it tracks the changes that you make to the file. Uh, so in public accounting, we've, we've never seen situations where we have large staff turnover on jobs and new people have to pick it up and the person that did it is long gone from the firm. That never happens in our world. Um, so we uh, we need to deal with it all. I'm being, I'm being sarcastic, but we need to deal with this all the time because we, we do have constantly have turnover. And if the documentation is, is maintained by the software, then uh, a reasonable person can pick it up and they can see what the person did the year before. So it tells you what you did. And then if you're ever being um, reviewed from a practice inspection or a uh, regulatory perspective, we do have the documentation and the process that we work through with IDEA and it will tell the, the person what we need to do. So we don't have to explain our, our steps or add a separate document to say what, what we did. We could just walk them through how we we downloaded the file, how we verified the total, and how we worked through it, and, and did the individual test that we do. So, um, very early in my career, we used to do a lot of things manually, and a lot of people think that you just use IDEA for sampling, which you do, but it's one of the basic things that you use for. So it is it is really effective on some some unique uh, clients. We have found frauds with it before. We have found um, where a client has downloaded a, um, a purchase, um, a purchase cost or an inventory cost, uh, master file, we found mistakes in it. 
and uh, we've done it where we've had um, financial services entities where we've actually helped the client improve the quality of their database. We found mistakes that were in the database that the uh, that the IT guy, he, he wanted to kill us for when we first started auditing the entity. And then by the end of the first year, he wanted to buy idea himself so he could test the changes that he was making by manipulating the whole the whole database. Um, so some of my best examples of, of idea come from from older clients, but um, we've done some some things where we had a client that had 3000 subscribers to an RESP. And when we finished auditing them, they had a couple hundred thousand subscribers to an RESP. Um, and as you can imagine, the audit fee did not increase by 50 times over that time frame. So we were able to actually do more or less the same things with 200,000 people in the, in the in the plan as we were when there were 3,000 people in the plan. So it uh, it is it is pretty strong and it's pretty powerful. And I think our staff like using it. So it makes uh, it makes their jobs more interesting because if they didn't have idea, they'd have to do some things that either they wouldn't want to do manually or, or the quality of the sample wouldn't be nearly as high. Um, and it does, it does automate manual tasks. So things that you really don't want to do in your job, IDEA does it for you. So I think, I think more or less we talked about that, but the, um, one of the other key things you'll see today is is the uh, the different the variety of different files that you can get into idea um, it is uh, there's all kinds of different formats that you can use and there's all kinds of different ways that you can use it so if a client can give us a report whether it's an electronic format or pdf we can probably get it into idea and do the data that we want to do and if you can imagine with all the risks around cybersecurity and other things these days a client doesn't just want to use give us a database they're quite happy to give us a report now we'd probably prefer that we get that report in electronic print format rather than PDF print format. But a lot of times the client knows how to give it to us in PDF because that's what they use all the time. Um, and we use it that way. But it's uh, it's pretty, uh, it's been a pretty good thing that we've had uh, and used as a firm. Uh, it seems like it's it's relatively up to date, but the software is actually, I think it might, it might be getting close to 40 years old now. It's been updated a million times, but. Uh, it was first it was first started in the in the early 80s i think so i'll um, i'll just run through my example quickly uh kayla will will talk about um uh, hers and apec will talk about hers and then they'll get into the presentation so um, around uh, 20 years ago we had a balloon company so if you can imagine uh, what a balloon company does is they make hundreds of thousands of balloons and the cost per balloon is really, really small. It was a new client to us and the senior manager on it was a little less stubborn than the uh, in charge was. And the in charge tried to do the sample manually and um, it was a pricing sample and she just she just picked a, a random sample of 10 or 20 or whatever it was that we needed to do. And then the senior manager said, well, that's not the way we plan to do it. And that's not the way we sold it to this client. So um, I want I want us to do the the work in idea. So we did it. We did do it in idea. And what we found is that there were certain things that would cost a tenth of a cent in uh, per unit in the um, in the database. So a thousand balloons might cost them a uh, hundred dollars or something like that, or some cost component for the the balloons and uh, the master file had them in at, at um, I believe it was a dollar a piece instead of a tenth of a cent. So the numbers that were in the master file were were completely out of whack. They were out of whack by hundreds of times. And uh, we found this with ID, and the client was amazed that we had found it. And they, you know, they fixed their database. But the person that was too stubborn to use it originally, um, she actually uh, she changed her tune fairly quickly because she realized that we actually would have had a materially misstated financial statement if we didn't find this error and we never would have found it using any method other than than what we did with idea we uh, we probably could have uh, probably could have used it um, in uh, in 
in Excel probably would have worked in, in a certain way, but there's no guarantee and, and we didn't have the ability to compare as easily as we would have with IDEA. We probably would have had to do like a manual scan and you still could have missed it because the numbers are really small. Um, more recently, we've had clients that have bought other financial services entities and we've gone through and done a lot of stuff for them in a due diligence perspective where we've we've recalculated their um, their specific uh, loan allowance, the allowance that relates to uh, loans that are already impaired. So we identified everything that was impaired. We recalculated accrued interest. We looked, we separated things by interest rate category so we could find out what their pricing was on certain, uh, certain uh, deposits and loans. And in a lot of cases, a, an organization that's struggling will probably pay too much interest on deposits and charge not enough on loans and their margin's not as good as it should be, which is why they're struggling. But with IDEA, all of this information was done rather easily, and we could provide it to the report to the client, and then the client had, had specific uh, files in the, in the portfolio that they could look to adjust the rates when they had that opportunity. So it's been really effective for us uh, in both the manufacturing environment where you have a lot of inventory and you can compare inventory year to year, or you can, comparing this like subsequent selling prices uh, on things to see if something has been sold uh, with a loss on it and also in financial services where you have a lot of information often uh, uh, you know you're trying to be efficient in your organization so you'll you'll use IT ex exclusively to do a lot of things and you'll have an awful lot of material in a database that they can use for all kinds of different purposes in addition to just financial reporting so it's been really good to us um, the one thing I will speak to as well is in this environment with COVID, things are changing very rapidly. And uh, for example, if we have inventory that goes obsolete or inventory that they have to sell at a discount, you think of all the stores that have been closed where they have things that could go bad. We could identify things that have been in inventory for a period of time since the last purchase before a certain date, if it's got a uh, possibility of becoming obsolete or going bad and uh, we we may have products that they don't sell anymore because the market's not there so we could uh, identify like packaging equipment or sorry, packaging products and things like that that they use to pack it and ship it to the market so when you're dealing with COVID and we have things that have, have changed in the business you can isolate certain information using idea and I think it'll be really really helpful so I'll stop there uh, and Kayla and, and APEC will give an example of what they've seen in their careers. Uh, theirs are obviously shorter than mine, but they're using it directly on a regular basis almost every day right now. And then we'll uh, get into the example and uh, we'll, uh, if you have any questions, we'll take those as probably as you go along as well. So I uh, hope this is helpful. I think uh, historically it's proven to be. And I think, uh, I think there's a, uh, if you haven't used IDEA before, I think uh, whether you use it um now or in the future um it's definitely helpful to your audit and helpful to your audit team our approach is, is that we use our, our teams to do it um, our staff are trained fairly early on in their career to use idea we don't we don't send it off to uh the people that do specialty it work we've actually trained it to uh, to do it with within the teams it does probably work better for us because our clients are are generally medium-sized businesses where uh we don't you know the the structure that might be in with a large public company it might be better to start, send it to the IT group to do the testing but this way one of the benefits we have is if if someone like Kalo or APEC can find something that doesn't quite make sense they don't have to restart the testing again they can just make a modification to to what they're going to do and fix it and then have it back uh, up and running within five or ten minutes rather than have to wait a couple of days for someone to send it back to to either of them so Kayla, do you want to go? Sounds good. Good morning, everyone. So more or less in my day-to-day -day work, um, I do a lot of the journal entry testing now on files. So this is a very standard fraud procedure to figure out if there are journal entries that are strange, and unusual, uh, that we need to ask further detail about. So one of the great things with idea for journal entry testing is being able to take hundreds of thousands of journal entries summarizing them and then comparing it 
to last year's trial balance and this year's trial balance to see if uh, the journal entries they gave us are actually complete. If they're not complete, that can uh, bring about a lot of problems when we're trying to do sampling or other work over the journal entries. IDEA also has some powerful tools where you can uh, you can select all of the entries that, for example, don't have a description when maybe one of the controls is that it's supposed to have a description or a number of round entries, which might be indicative of something strange. Um, if entries are being posted on weekends or other analysis tools where we can then take these hundreds of thousands of entries, narrow them down to a select few to go and ask for support over and ask uh, management like why these entries are being made. I'll pass it off to Apec now for her experience. Hi everyone. So when I first began my career at Grant Thornton, a lot of my tasks ended up being setting up the file and the trial balance. So whenever we got support from clients that was either hard to work with or in PDF format and we had to pick samples or anything, I would actually use IDEA to clean up any of these documents and this helped us a lot when we had to put these trial balances in other software such as Caseware for example and make our lead sheets. I also used IDEA to clean up any general ledgers that we received from the client because sometimes they would be too large for us to get it all in one big file in one file so they would end up giving us four different files for, for the different quarters and I'd use IDEA to compile this and then run completeness to make sure everything has been picked up and our entries equal zero. So I know that it's good to go. And then I also use IDEA to pick any of my samples when I did work on operating expenses and I wanted to pick certain transactions and legal fees or advertising to select. I would just run a random sample and I would IDEA would give me either how many ever samples I wanted so that I could send that over to the client to request support for. So now we can move on to seeing IDEA in action. So we're going to work on the K9 Steel case. So I've just opened up IDEA already. And one thing I guess I can show you guys is that if you want to create your own database or new project, all you'd have to go is under, all you have to do is go under home, create, and you can create, you can select manage project and call it whatever you want. So I've already done that for the presentation so that I have all my files here. So when I have different audit clients going on, I will usually create my own project and call them different things so that I can always go back into it in the future. So our first task is to test the extended value of the 2010 and 2011 inventory listing. So we're going to work on importing this. So first, before I import anything in Excel, I usually open it up on my laptop and try to clean it up as much as I can so that I'm not importing anything into IDEA that I don't want to be there. So I'm going to let that load. So now that's here. Um, so basically, since I don't really want any control totals because IDEA will actually total this for me. I'll just go ahead and we will delete all of this information. And then at the top, you can see that they have the description as well as the title. I'm just going to delete that as well. I'm going to keep the, the column names because actually an idea when you import it, you can select a box that lets you keep these so that you don't have to go back in and name these fields in IDEA. So that's really helpful. So I'm going to delete that. And what I usually do is just highlight and see some of the numbers. I'll just go and see like the sum that it's 5 million so that I know when I import an idea that I've captured everything just for my own peace of mind. So I'm just going to go ahead and save that and close this. So when I go to idea, when you import a file, you're going to go to desktop. You're going to be sure to select the proper format. So since this is an Excel file, I'm going to go ahead and select that. I'm going to click this under file name so I can go and find it. So I saved mine under Waterloo presentation. So that's here. And we're going to import 2011 because their year end is in 2011. So we're going to do work on that first. So over here, an idea when you import it, you can see that you can actually select the sheets to import. Since I want list, I'm going to select that. And over here, this is the option I was talking about. First row is field names. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. And then 
import empty numeric cells as zero just to make everything clean. And I'm going to keep the file name as 2011 ending inventory listing. So I've had this already set up. And then under File Explorer, you'll see what you've uh, imported in. So the 2011 in ending inventory listing is here. If I go to properties, there's this cool thing called control total. I'm just going to click that. And over here, anything that is a numeric field type will show up and IDEA will actually calculate the numeric total for you. So I'm going to go ahead and click on value. And that's around 5 million and 14. And that's exactly what my Excel sheet had. So then here's how I know that whatever I had on my Excel is captured perfectly in IDEA. And over here, you'll see some columns that got picked up accidentally. And in IDEA, you can actually remove this. So you can go under data remove and here you can remove column seven and then you can go ahead press yes you can do the same for column eight as well so once i've cleaned this up because i don't want extra columns in here we're good to go and now we're going to go ahead and calculate our extended value just to make sure that what the client has is accurate so I'm going to click on any one of the cells in value because my new column when I add it will actually show up to the right of the cell I enter and I want it to be right after value. I'm going to click this cell for 20. I'm going to right click and I'm going to click the option to append field. So this pops up here and I'm just going to call this extended value. I'm going to keep it virtual numeric and just to keep it consistent, they have two decimals, so I'm going to just keep it two decimals as well. And then for my parameters, so this is where I can determine what my new field is going to be. So I'm going to click the calculator option. And I'm actually going to click multiply. I'm going to multiply quantity by the cost. So since those are the fields that I want to calculate, I'll select them from here or you can type them in. So I'll just type in cost. And we're good to go. We're going to click this option to validate to make sure everything's valid and that's fine. It's going to click OK. Everything's good to go here. So this is what I've calculated here. And now to see if there are any differences, I'm going to again add a new column. So click the cell, right click, left click, sorry, append field. And I'm going to call this the difference. I'm going to keep it two decimal places as well. And I'm going to subtract value. I'm going to use one of these options here, subtract it, and extended value. It's a valid equation, good to go. So this is going to give me my differences. And I'm going to click the control total quickly, and I'm going to calculate the total difference. So it tells me that my total difference is $1.7 million. And sometimes I'll just hide, quickly double click the top column where difference is and just to see where my largest differences are. So when I did this, I noticed that my largest difference is for $571,000 for inventory type 19. So with all these differences, we'd usually make a note of this and ask the client why there is a difference and if there's something wrong with their calculation on their end, just so that we know we're working with the accurate data. So now I'm going to determine if the inventory costs are consistent to prior. But before I do that, I just want to see if there are any questions. Kayla, is there anything on? I don't see anything uh, uh, Okay. No chat yet. Okay, no problem. So now we'll just uh, do a prior year comparison. We're going to work with our 2010 data. So I'm going to go ahead and open that as well. Again, I'm going to clean this up because I do not need this information on here. I'm just going to check the bottom to make sure there's no control totals because we don't want that imported. go ahead and save that. I, I think with IDEA, you usually want to close any of the Excel databases you're working on when you're importing it, just so it's smoother. And I think IDEA actually doesn't let you import when it's still open. 
So I'm going to go ahead and import this 2010 ending inventory listing. So I'm going to go to desktop under home. Again, it was in Excel. So I'm going to move up here, click that, and I'm going to go find the file. Click next. I want cheat one and I'm going to make sure I click these two options. So it's all good to go. And I'm fine with the output name. So here I have my 2010 ending inventory listing. So I'm going to actually run a quick control total on here just to make sure the values are the same. And yeah, so this is the value on my Excel sheet that I had deleted previously. So I know that everything is captured and we're good to go. So now when we want to compare the cost between 2011 and 2010, I'm going to actually join these two sheets together. So in order for us to do that, we're going to go under analysis and under the relate box, there's an option to join. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. So over here in joining databases, you'll see that my primary database is going to be the 2011 and the inventory listing. And for my secondary database, I have nothing here. So I'm going to have to select this. So I'm going to go here, pick the 2010. So in order for me to match these databases perfectly, so I essentially just want all the inventory items to be matched perfectly. So I want the type 19 basically in 2011 to match the type 19 in 2011, 2010 on the same row so that when I'm comparing costs, I'm comparing the cost for the same inventory item. I'm going to go ahead and click match here. And when doing so, you want to make sure that what you're matching is the same field type. So if my item number is numeric, so that's the N, in my primary database for the 2011 ending inventory listing, I want to make sure that the item number is also numeric for my secondary. And if it isn't, I can show you guys how to do that. So all you do is click, left click, sorry, right click this, um, modify field, and you can actually go ahead and change. So right now, description was character. We're just gonna leave that there. I'm gonna join again, select 2010. So since I wanna match my item number and they were both numeric before, we're good to go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep it the same and just match it based on item number. And I'm going to do all records in both files because I want to capture everything in my 2011 as well as everything in my 2010. So now I'm going to have both, I'm going to have a joint database with both my 2011 and 2010. I'm just going to do a quick look through to make sure that it matched perfectly. So if I go here on row two, type one in 2011 is type one. It's matched perfectly to type one in our 2010. And I know this is 2010 because it has one attached to each of the descriptions. So everything looks fine here. So what I'm gonna do now is calculate the difference in our cost. So I'm gonna go to the rightmost, the right column for value. I am going to right click append field because I wanna make a difference column. And I'm going to name this difference in cost. Virtual numeric is fine. And I'm going to keep it consistent with two decimal places. For my parameter, once again, I'm going to go to my calculator and I'm going to subtract. My cost from 2011 from my cost in 2010. It's going to check it's valid. And we're good to go. So now this new column will tell me the difference in costs. And now we basically want to see anything that does have a difference. So I'm going to go ahead and extract these differences. So under analysis, we're going to go to direct. I'm going to call this cost differences for now. I'm going to click this calculator here. And since what I want to extract is everything greater or less than zero, I'm going to, and I want to sample, and I want to extract this based on our difference in cost sample. I'm going to go ahead and select that.
and I got different or not equal to, and I'm going to type in zero. And this is a valid equation. So once I'm okay with all of this, I'm going to put okay. And when extracting, you're going to see that a new sheet pops up here with all our differences. And then from here, I'm going to double click this column just to have it sorted by the value. And from here, I can see that the, our largest difference is for $35 and it's for our inventory type 138. So this is something that we usually make a note of and inquire with management why the costs have changed from the prior year. Are there any questions so far? It looks like there isn't anything at the moment. Okay, no problem. Give a couple moments for people to catch up maybe. Yep, I'll give a couple moments. If there are any questions at all, uh, feel free to type them out to us. Yeah, definitely. We'll keep checking as we go. Yep. <laughs> I guess I'll move on to the next task. So now we're going to determine whether the inventory is stated at the lower cost or realizable value. So basically, we have the 2011 pricing list. So I'm going to compare that to our 2011 cost. So I'm going to go ahead and import that. So once again, I'm going to go to home. I'm going to go to desktop. And because our pricing list I noticed was a text format, I'm going to make sure that I'm highlighted over on the text option. Go and find that. So that's here. Open that and then click next. And as you can see under fixed length, it looks very messy right now. Usually we use delimited and it sorts it properly. So that's what we want. We want to make sure that we have our type and the appropriate sales price right next to it so that when we import it into IDEA, it's very clean. So we go ahead and click next. Now over here, we're going to separate the columns so that I can import the sales price in a different column than the type of inventory so that I can actually subtract my sales price from my cost later on. So I'm going to go ahead and find something that's common between all of that to make sure that there's proper column setups. So one thing I know is that they all have their, their spaces there. So there's no not really a comma or anything there. So I'm going to go ahead and click space. And as you can see, the lines will pop up, separating the type, the number, as well as the sales price. And since I want to basically compare the item numbers, if you look on my sheet here, an idea. My item numbers just have the actual number. If my number is separated like this, I am good to go. And as long as my sales price is in a separate column, that will be fine. So I'm going to go ahead and click next. Since I don't want this type column, I'm just going to click the option to do not import this field. And this one, I'm just going to go ahead and call this item number two. I'm going to keep this numeric because I do remember that item number in my 2011 ending inventory was numeric as well. And then for this one, I'm just going to go ahead and call that the sales price. Keep it numeric as well. And I'm just going to go ahead and just make it two decimals. And I don't want to add any more fields. So I'm just going to click next here. And there's no equation or any import criteria. I don't want to limit any of the data. So I'm going to go ahead and click next again. I'm, I'm OK with calling it 2011 pricing. So I'm just going to finish here. So here we have our 2011 pricing. So now I want to basically do another join database so that I can compare my 2011 ending inventory cost to my 2011 pricing. So I'm going to go ahead on my 20 inventory listing. And once again, I'm going to go under join. I'm going to select the database. So that's my 2011 pricing. 
I want all records in both files to capture everything. I'm just going to call that L. Okay. And now with matching, I want to do it based on our item number. And because I had made that numeric when I imported, we are good to go and they're the same field type. Then once this is all done, I'm just going to click OK. And here we go, we've matched it. So my, since we matched our item numbers, one and one has been appropriately matched on the same row. So I know that the data I'm working with is accurate. So now in order to determine the differences, once again, I'm gonna go to the right column under sales price, click any cell there, right click, append field. And I'm gonna call this difference between and our cost. I'm gonna keep it consistent and have two decimals. And now for our parameter, once again, I'm gonna click that calculator here. And I'm going to subtract our cost. I'm going to go here from our sales price. It's a valid equation. We're good to go. And now this, these are all our differences between our sales price and cost. So now I'm just going to extract anything that is over zero to see basically where our cost is over our sales price because with this test we're concerned that we're not able to recover any of the costs in making the product so since we have subtracted costs first we're only concerned with positive values so i'm going to go ahead and under analysis going to click direct i'm going to call this extraction Sales price. Again, I'm going to click the calculator here. And since the column that I want to extract is the difference between sales price and cost, and I want everything over zero, I'm going to click this option for greater than here. Zero. Check if it's a valid equation, and here we go. So when I did that, I noticed that there are two inventory items that are selling lower than cost. So this is something that we'd want to ask management to figure out what, what's happening with the market right now. Why are they not able to recover any of their costs in making these right costs of making these inventory items? And that's just something we perform further work on if needed. Any questions so far? It doesn't look like there are any questions, questions? yet. Okay. So I'm going to move on to the procedures under seven. So I'll actually work on B first. So that's determining which items require further obsolescence testing. So we're gonna compare our 2010 and our 2011 inventory levels for items with no inventory changes throughout the year. So basically no purchases or no sales so that we could ask management, what's really going on with these items? Are they obsolete? Like why are they not selling? Or why are there more purchases basically? So to do that, I want to combine our 2011 and 2010, which I've already done. So I'm going to go ahead and go to that database here. And I'm going to make a new column. So again, right column. I'm going to click one of those cells, right click. I'm going to append our field. And I'm going to call this difference in our quantity. Keep it this one, two decimals. To make it consistent and over here I basically want to subtract our quantity from 2011 and our quantity from 2010 so that has the one attached to it because I imported it sec I when I joined it that was my second database and since it had the same title it just added a one to it so I'm just gonna make sure it's valid so over here, I have my difference in quantity. So if I want to see all the items that had no change in inventory, I'm going to extract the amounts from this column. So once again, we're going to go under analysis, direct. 
I'm gonna call this quantity and I'm gonna click the calculator option there. And I'm gonna type in the column that I want to extract. So that's this one. And I basically want anything that had no changes in the year. So that's basically equal to zero. Make sure it's a valid equation. So we're good to go there. I'm gonna click accept and okay. So our difference in quantity, so these are the items. So there's 23 items here. Well, there's 22, this one just got, this is just an empty field. So there's technically 22 items that have no changes between 2010 and 2011. So this is something that we would ask management and just get the reasons on why there were no sales and no purchases made between the two years. Okay, so now I'll pass it over to Kayla to finish off with inventory procedure C, A, and then accounts payable as well. Thanks, Apak. Yeah, you should have it. Okay. I'm controlling your uh, cursor now? Hold it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay, so to determine if there are any slow moving items, which could also be an indicator of obsolescence, we need to first uh, import the subsequent uh, sales journal. So from January and February of 2012. So we'll go to home, desktop, Excel. We scroll to find it. And click next. So as we can see here, just like uh, for the inventory listings, our headers are all in this first uh, row. So we can say that the first row is our field names. There aren't any totals at the bottom, so we're good to go. Import the numeric fields of zero. File name is good. We press OK. And here we go. Now we have all of the sales from January and February 2012 imported into IDEA. So in order to see if uh, certain items had been sold later, might not have been sold afterwards, we need to summarize this data by the inventory type so that we can join it later and see what hasn't moved. So to do that, we'll go back into our analysis tab. In this categorize section, we'll click summarization. And this is where we can summarize then, instead of by unit, we can do it by type. And then summarize the quantity. So that gives us the number of units uh, for each inventory type that have been sold. rename it to something that you know to find later on so subsequent sales it's okay and here we can see now the types of inventory that have been sold after the year end and this number of recs shows how many uh, records there were for the sales subsequent to the year end so now we will join this with our 2011 ending inventory listing. So to do that, as Apec uh, walked you through earlier, we'll go into this relate section and press join. We'll select our secondary database. Our summarization here, press okay. We will match based on our description this time. So you can see that with this, IDEA is also smart enough to match character fields, not just numeric fields. However, the field type has to be the same when you are joining databases, um, otherwise IDEA won't recognize it. So I'll hit OK. All records in both files. And we will rename this 
inventory sales after year end. Select OK. And here we go. We can see uh, from our 2011 listing, this inventory type is matched up now with uh, the inventory type for the sales. So to figure out which ones have not had any change in uh, or any sales after the year end, we're going to do another extraction. So again, in this analysis tab, go to extract, go to direct. Your name is no subsequent sales. I have to delete this. Okay. And so how we will know that a, an inventory, a piece of inventory hasn't been sold after the year end is if in the sales listing, uh, there is nothing that's been joined. So we will go to quantity sum is equal to zero. Make sure it's valid and press okay. And so this, now you'll be able to see which ones are actually in inventory and haven't been sold after the year end. Okay, any questions on anything in inventory so far? It looks like we're doing well so far. So let's switch gears now to accounts payable. So this import with the PDF listing is probably one of the hardest uh, imports you will ever need to do with IDEA. So effectively, what you are doing is taking a PDF and creating rows and columns to make it almost like an Excel file, but without manually typing everything out, which would take literally forever. So we'll go to Home, Import, Desktop. Now this time, instead of selecting Excel or one of these other formats, we'll select the print report and Adobe PDF. And we'll find our file. It's important to note, um, I've had some clients where they've given me scans of paper notes or scans of something that they've printed out. And most of the time that is not readable by idea. So you really do need a report that's actually printed from the system to a PDF rather than a scan of a paper. So we'll select next year. And as it reads and finds the information, you can see this is our IP listing. So from looking at this, we can see that there are kind of two different levels of information. We have the invoice and the payment side, and then we also have the customer name which doesn't, which isn't replicated through all of this. So in IDEA, what we do is create effectively layers of information that we try to join together to then create kind of this Excel format. So the first layer we go, we're gonna create is for all of these transactions. So to do that, what we need to do is along one of these lines, click and drag, and you should see this black bar pop up. And then when you release, this report reader should come up as well. So we'll create a standard layer and select yes. Okay, you should only ever have one line selected, not two or more, so that can uh, create some problems. So now to capture all this information, we do something called trapping. So this is where we have to look through all of the information through this PDF to find a pattern. Now, generally with information uh, like this, a good pattern is your date column, as long as the date format is consistent through everything and not shifted around one way or another. So we can see here that even in the months where and days where there uh, is only one digit, there's a zero ahead of it so that it's consistent with the rest of the dates. So now to trap, we will go above these two yellow lines and click. And then these are your trapping tools. So you can trap based on text, 
based on numbers, based on spaces, or based on having anything except a space. Additionally, you can also, with your keyboard, actually type in like a specific letter, specific number that is that could also be replicated through all of your data. So in this case, because we know that the month is going to change, what we will use is our numeric trap. So we'll click that twice. And then when we get to this uh, slash, we know that it's always going to be a slash at that position. So instead of using, say, a text trap or a non-blank trap, what we can do is on our computer type the slash. And so we see that none of this information has uh, been invalidated. So anything that idea is pulling for rows will show up in gray. And it looks like from a scroll through that everything is there. So now we have to create our columns. We've trapped all of our rows and we need to create uh, the columns now. So to do that, we will start selecting between these two yellow lines. So we'll click down and drag across. And this now creates our trap. So over on the side here where it says field details, we can rename this column, call it source. We can see that based on the first row that we captured, IDEA has identified it as a numeric field. However, if we look a little bit uh, through our data here, there's some dashes here, there's cache. So it's not actually a numeric type. So we can change this to a character type so that we don't have errors when we import. So the next thing that we can trap is our date. We'll go over here and rename it to date. And now there is actually a field type for date. And when we select that, it asks us to put in a mask. So this is for us to tell IDEA, this is your month, day, year format. It's not going to be consistent from client to client or report to report. So we will go month, month, slash, day, day, slash, year, 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 year. And then we can click and trap our next column. Transaction type. It is a character field, so that's all good. And then finally, we have our total field. We'll select all the way across here. And you see how when I select based on uh, this position between the yellow lines, the gray cuts off some of the other numbers. So if you need to adjust a field length within this, when you scroll over this uh, orange, you'll get a double arrow. You click and you can drag to reduce the size or increase the size. So in this case, we'll increase the size here and rename our uh, field total. And you see that it automatically identifies that there are two decimals as well. So another important thing to note is where there are shifts in this data because of the uh, negative amount, it's not going to impact how IDEA actually reads it. It will still see this as a, as a number with two decimal points and the negative, it will also automatically identify. So we are good to go with this layer then. We can press the green checkbox. And now it shows these, this is all the information that it's trapped so far on this report. So what I like to do after each step is to scan for errors. So you can do that by going to traps. You can see there's a little magnifying glass here for scan for errors. Or along this toolbar, there's also that same magnifying glass for scan for errors. So we'll select that and it will tell us if a field is not long enough or the wrong data format. And so here it's identified that this uh, transaction type is not long enough. 
So to change that, we can use these buttons to increase or decrease the field width and the position. So we will add all of those and press change. And so now there are no other errors, so we are good to go with trapping our next layer. Okay, so the next layer that we need to trap is the supplier name. Because without that, uh, we don't know whose invoice it is or whose payment it is, so it'll be very hard to summarize all this information by uh, supplier. So we'll do the same thing. We'll click and drag across to get that black bar. We'll create another standard layer. And so now when we're trying to trap based on these uh, names, it's even more important that we really make sure we're not trapping information we really don't want. So we can see that not every supplier has a number to start. So we can't use, say, a numeric trap. Um, likewise, we also can't use a text trap because that would kick out all of these uh, suppliers that begin with a number. So when we click above the yellow line, we will have to select the non-blank trap. So I'll click one of those. Now we can see that we get some of the header information trapped along with this total outstanding. So when we are looking at all of this, we can see that with the total outstanding, it has a value here, whereas our supplier name has nothing. So above those positions, you can click up here and press space trap. So our information at that position will always have a space, is what we're telling it. The trick with making these uh, traps is to make sure it's generic enough, but not overly generic, and specific enough, but not overly specific, that you're removing information that you need. So since this header does not uh, replicate through the rest of the pages, we can ignore it. So what we're gonna do next, we'll kick it out, so we won't end up with that information in our report. So like we did before, between these two yellow lines now, we will click, drag across to create now the column for our supplier name. And under attributes in this field details column, instead of leaving blank cells blank, this is how we're going to join this column to the rest of our information. We're going to change this from leave blank to use value from previous record. So once we've done that, we save our layer. We'll do the scan for errors again, make sure that we're capturing all that we need. There are no errors, so we're good to go. So before we can import this, uh, what IDEA will ask us to do is to save this template. So saving a template like this is really useful for passing on to future years, or if you have multiple reports that are similar. So for example, I have a client where we get monthly sales data in PDF. And so once we've trapped one month of it, we can use this template to create the traps for the other 12 months and import it very quickly instead of going through this entire process 12 times. So it's a good efficiency uh, aspect. We'll press save. And then right beside the save button, there's a button that says import to idea or I think in the file option, you can also import report into idea. And so we'll finish. As we scroll through here, we can see that everything has, looks like it has imported correctly. So for part A of A, 
It's asking us to summarize the listing of the AP to show the total balance outstanding by supplier. So like we've done before, we'll go to analysis. Under categorize, click summarization. And from summarization, we will summarize it by our supplier name now. And we will total the total. Name the file, AP summarization. Okay, and we can see here now what the outstanding balance is for each of these suppliers at the end of the year. Are there any questions or concerns so far? We're good to go. <laughs> Looks like it. Okay, so we'll move on to part B then of our accounts payable where we need to identify anything that's unusual. So the first uh, asks us to extract outstanding balances with an outstanding balance over $1 million. So like we have done before to extract information, we'll go into analysis, extract, direct. We'll rename this to AP over 1 million, click our calculator, type in our total sum is greater than 1 million. Validate it, press OK. And so here, we can identify there are five suppliers that have a balance of more than a million dollars at standing at the year end. So these are items that maybe it's normal for this company to have so much outstanding at once, or maybe it is something that we have to ask management about to figure out if it's weird, unusual, or actually normal for them. So then finally, the last part of this uh, identifying unusual items is to extract outstanding balances over 90 days. So to do this, we don't actually have um, detailed information of only which invoices are, are still outstanding. So we will need to go back to this AP listing that we've imported and we will add a date column to it. Uh, sorry, not a date column, an aging column to it so that we can extract everything over 90 days and then summarize it to see which balances look like they could be more than 90 days old. So we will append a field. So right click, append a field. We'll call this field aging. We won't touch the field type or the number of decimals in this case. We will go to parameter here. And this is a really cool function of IDEA where we can take the date and now uh, have IDEA calculate the age of those invoices and those payments. So if you ever need to find um, an IDEA function that you have an idea of what you wanna do, not sure how to do it, over on this side here, it actually shows you all of the functions and it will show you a description of what the parameters are, what the syntax is, and an example of how to use it. So with this at age function, we'll type in at age, double click that. It is telling us that date number one is going to be either a date field or a constant date. So in this case, it will be our date field because that's what we want to calculate. So we'll type in date, put in a comma to now separate them. And for date two, it's saying that it needs to be later than the, uh, the first date needs to be later than the second date for it to be positive or in this case, it's going to be negative because we put our date field in first, which is okay. So to type in our year end date, which is December 31st of 2011, 
we will use quotation marks here. And that tells IDEA that it is a date or a character rather than a number. So we'll type in 2011, 12, 31, which is how IDEA will always read dates. It is always year, month, day. So we'll click validate, make sure it's okay. And then apply it. And so we can see here then, because our second date was later than our first date, the aging comes out negative, which is all fine as long as you can keep your uh, signs uh, straight. So we will do this summarization again. Summarize by our supplier name. Summarize by total. We don't really need to summarize by aging. It won't give us uh, information that we really need. So then we will say AP summarization. Oh, sorry. I am skipping a step here. Let's cancel this. We're going to first actually extract all of our invoices and payments that are older than 90 days. So we'll direct extract AP over 90 days. Our aging is less than or equal to 90. This is where keeping our signs uh, in place is important to remember, validate. And press OK. So now this is everything that is older than 90 days. Oh, wait. There, it should be less than or equal to negative 90. So again, that whole science thing. Older than 90 days. Center equal to negative 90. Here we go. There, now we can see under all of this aging that there isn't anything that is uh, greater than that negative 90. Okay, so now we can summarize this to see by the supplier name to see uh, which suppliers actually have a balance uh, that is over. Uh, 90 days past due. Thank you over 90, summarization, click OK. And here we go. So since we're not able to apply, like remove any payments that have been applied to a specific invoice in this case, what we can do is from these totals, where we see there are some suppliers that ha that appear to have uh, invoices outstanding for more than 90 days. So you can go back to our AP summarization and compare it there and say that, you know, this first uh, supplier at the year end actually only has $6,000 outstanding. Whereas here we're saying there's over 1.6 million. So chances are it's just, uh, uh, missed timing with our payment being applied here. Same thing if we look at, say, Sunoco Canada, it shows here as having 5.56 million outstanding. But if we go to our AP summarization, scroll down to Sunoco, we can see that there really is only 2.1 million outstanding at the end of the year. So chances are that's the balance that's over 90 days old. So are there any questions at this point? No, I think we're good.
give it a couple minutes maybe. Yeah. Are there any questions at all? There's a lot of stuff that you can play around with an idea too. I think someone was trying to say something. Okay, we're good. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, you three, for presenting another really great session. Um, I'll I'll have the students email, you know, um, if they have any questions I'll, and that would be applicable to any of you three, I'll forward it on. But thank you very much for uh, presenting and uh, sharing your insights. Thank you for Thanks, having sir. us. Right. Pleasure.